Thank you for coming to this event. Sponsored by the Cooley, the Kimball Center for Legal Drafting at WMU Cooley. We've had a amazing record turnout. So thank you all for, uh, for signing up. Just a brief word at the outset about the Kimball Center. Created by Cooley in 2017, I hasten to add that I didn't name it. Uh, so, but I'm honored, of course, and uh, we have a public service mission. We, this is our second, this is our second public seminar. Uh, we, we are trying to create some user friendly documents for the public. The 1st, one we did a medical power of attorney, which you should all have. Um, uh, has been downloaded. It's on available on the, the center's website. It's been downloaded a 1000 times. Uh, we have got some. Other projects in the works that promise to be exciting can't announce those yet. We have a fantastic board of international uh, advisors uh, that you can check out, see the names and the faces on the uh, on the website if you like. And so that's what I want to say about the uh, about the uh, the center. Um, our time here is tight, obviously. Thirty tips. Each of us will give you 10. Uh, you can put questions in the chat. We'll try to save a little time after each presentation to answer uh, questions, but it can be interactive as we uh, as we go. And so I will just say that I'm not going to get into everybody's bios, uh, uh, but you will be hearing from two superstars and one pretender. And the pretender will will begin. So I will share my screen if this all works. And here we go. Can you see it? See it okay? Here we go. 30 tips for better legal writing and drafting. And I will do I will do my 10 and we will start off with a top tip. Root out unnecessary prepositional phrases. Question every of. Now this may sound too simple, okay, but it works. I didn't say replace, I said question. Think twice about every of. You might have an unnecessary prepositional phrase. And this applies not just to legal writing, all kinds of formal and official writing. Uh, I think it's the worst small scale fault in all of these kinds of legal writing. There are three techniques that will work, at least three. You can turn a prepositional phrase into a possessive, the landlord's duty. You can turn a prepositional phrase into a kind of adjective, a court order. You can turn a the noun of phrase into an ing form, admitting the here state state statements was plain uh, error. Those those three techniques will work repeatedly. Okay, so let's now all of these examples, by the way, none of them are made up. They are all from before and after versions of various sets of US federal court rules, which I've been working on for the last last 20 years or so. So let's look at a couple of examples. A subpoena may be served by any person, say, 18 years of age, service of a subpoena. There are six prepositional phrases in this before uh, example. Now, a subpoena may be served by any person. Well, as a matter of fact, this is another technique, active voice, you know. Very often, uh, a passive construction, passive voice construction will have an unnecessary prepositional phrase prepositional phrase. So you can just turn this into any person may serve. That's one prepositional phrase down. See? Service of a subpoena. That's this technique. Serving rather than service of or the service of. Serving. And you reduce six and just look at the difference. I mean, just look at the difference in the length of these. And so you convert six unnecessary prepositional phrases into 
into just one to the named person. There's another example. This is from uh, the old and new federal rules of evidence. Watch this. Evidence of the beliefs or opinions of a witness on matters of religion. Watch. Beliefs or opinions of a witness easily converts to evidence of a witness's possessive. See, that was our first technique evidence of a witness's beliefs or opinions on matters of religion converts to easily to an adjective and it all becomes evidence of a witness's religious beliefs or opinions. And I think there's eight prepositional phrases in here and the revised version has just one. This is an infinity. So evidence of, that's the only one from eight to, uh, I believe eight to one. This is an important, this is an important tip for, a con, you know, removing clutter from all kinds of official and uh, formal and legal writing. Tip number two, try to collapse clauses and phrases into a word. Typically it's a relative clause that you are trying to collapse. Party that prevails on the motion easily becomes prevailing party. Issues that are relevant to this case, relevant issues. A person, see there's an understood who is there, right? It's still a relative clause, truncated, but a person, not a part of the action, you know, a uh, non-party. A judgment which may be entered. This is a little trickier, but a possible judgment. We're collapsing all of these relative clauses into a single word. Here again, you've got an understood uh, that is in this example. A city ordinance. It's pretty easy when you stop to think about some of these. Okay, that's tip number two. Tip number three, don't fear pronouns. There is this morbid fear out there among legal drafters, fear of using pronouns. Because there's an occasional case where, you know, the antecedent for a pronoun will not be clear and it leads to a, you know, court case. Well, the solution to that is make sure that the antecedent is clear. Uh, because otherwise, otherwise it gives legal drafting a kind of artificial, stilted, uh, a natural uh, kind of feel if you, if, 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 if you don't use any pronouns. So watch. If a party intends to challenge the order disposing of the motion, the party must file a notice of appeal or amended notice of appeal. The notice or amended notice. Well, why not just it must be filed within the time prescribed? You, you, you probably wouldn't talk that way. Or look at this example. An individual debtor in a Chapter 7 case must file a statement of current monthly income. And if the current monthly income, well, why not if it exceeds the median family income? So no reason to avoid using pronouns in legal drafting if the antecedent is if the antecedent is clear, and it's our job to make sure that it is clear. Be wary of intensifiers. These little phrases that, that, that seem to add some degree of emphasis, but they really, really create more confusion than they are often worth. So the notice shall be in writing and shall be addressed directly to the defendant. And then you have to stop and think, how do you address it indirectly to the defendant? I mean, what are they trying to cover see, with that directly? You know, what's the difference between address, directing, it, directing it directly and indirectly? The reader might, the reader might wonder. The court may in its discretion, may in its, that's what may means, you see, may in its discretion. See, and you'll get all kinds of variations on this. The court may, in its sole discretion, 
the court may in its sole and unfettered discretion and so on. You know, you may or you may not, court, it's up to you. That's what may means. If the court deems it advisable, well, presumably the court isn't going to do anything that it thinks is not advisable or is inadvisable. Court may, same kind of thing here. The court may in proper cases, well, is it going to do it, you know, improperly in improper cases? Affidavits must show affirmatively. How do they show implicitly? See, this is the problem. They raise these little nagging questions for the reader, and you don't know, you don't, you don't quite know what kind of a distinction uh, the drafter is trying to make. Inconsistent with substantial justice. Well, what's the difference between substantial justice and justice? The order shall be one striking the testimony, or if the court in its discretion determines that the interest of justice so requires. I wasn't able to get rid of all of this, but we did get it down to if justice so requires. Declare a mistrial, if justice so requires. And again, I question whether you even need that because, um, but at any, any rate, uh, the court in its discretion again determines that the interest of justice, if justice so requires, it, it was the final version of that. Unless the appointing order expressly directs otherwise, and I will leave it to you to identify the intensifier in that short example. Don't state the obvious. When? by these rules or by a notice given there under or by an order of the court. See, again, this raises this kind of a little nagging question from the reader, like, what are you leaving out? What are you trying to exclude? This seems to be everything. All the, this seems to be all the possibilities, see? So what is left out? See? And indeed, when the question was raised, there was nothing that we, we, we intended to leave out. So it all went. Rules applicable to captions and other matters of formal pleadings applied to all motions and other papers provided for by these rules. Well, of course, we're in the rules of civil procedure. We know we're talking about these rules. So, entirely obvious. A party may move for summary judgment in the party's favor. Now, you can, you lawyers can take a second here and say, well, what's obvious about this? Well, the party isn't going to move for summary judgment in the opponent's favor. So in the party's favor can go. A demand for jury trial made as herein provided. You've been talking in this section, you know, you can assume that you've been talking in this section about a demand for jury trial. And of course, we're still talking about the, the demand for jury trial that we were talking about two sentences ago or a sentence ago. A demand for jury trial, which we were just talking about, may not be withdrawn without the consent of the parties. And by the way, you might consider converting that from the negative, from uh, two negatives into a positive. This is a little side point. May not be withdrawn without, may be, may be withdrawn only. And I hope now that you will see me, this is like a mini review without the consent of the parties, consent of the parties, try a possessor, the party's consent. Shall give notice, we changed, oh, by the way, we changed all the shalls to must. Uh, all the shalls are disappearing from the US federal court rules with one painful example that I don't have time to get into here. Shall give notice to every other party. Well, of course, we're talking about parties in this case. See? Every other party to the action. We're not talking about any other parties outside these rules of uh, federal civil procedure. So that was tip number five. Don't state the obvious. Tip number six. Use a list to group conditions and exceptions, the mighty vertical list, the mighty vertical list as a way of sorting out um, uh, conditions 
uh, and exceptions, such a convenience, such an aid uh, to the reader. And by the way, conditions don't always appear as an if. Sometimes there are kind of sort of hidden conditions. So let's 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 look just for a second at this. Evidence of juvenile, this is a federal rule of evidence. Evidence of juvenile adjudications is generally not admissible. That's your general rule. Now you've got your uh, now you've got an exception. The court may, however, okay. So let's look at the uh, let's how many of these exceptions are there? Are? How many, uh, how many, actually we turn the exception into a condition, uh, which you can do sometimes. There's sometimes a fairly fine line between an exception and a condition. But, uh, so here's, here's one condition, it has to be a criminal case. Here's another condition, it has to be a evidence of a juvenile adjudication of, of a witness other than the accused. Here's your first if, you see. And that if has two parts. But how much better is it? How much easier is it for the reader to just see evidence of a juvenile adjudication under this uh, is admissible? I don't even know if you need under this rule. <laughs> Only if one, two, three, four. The mighty uh, vertical list. Uh, and uh, it's just such a great and useful technique uh, in uh, all kinds of, again, legal and, 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 and formal writing. Here's the before numbers. Here's another example. A written motion other than one, you see, whoops, that's an exception, right? So there's a general rule has to be served not later than five days before the time specified for the hearing. And then you get some exceptions. Again, pull these exceptions together in a uh, in a vertical list. State the main rule and then list and then list out your list out your exceptions. One other little side point here. It's generally not aesthetically pleasing that to, to have a list and it, it's not it's not strictly verboten, but uh, but generally you want to try to have the list end the sentence if you can. And so look what we did. We pulled this little piece, ex party application, we pulled that little piece into the third exception by using dashes, which a party may apply for ex party. The dash, don't deny yourself. I mean, I recommend for my money, don't deny yourself the dash. It is just too versatile and too useful for exactly this kind of purpose, tucking sentence, tuck, tucking information into, uh, into the sentence. And then we avoid having to, having to go back to the margin with that information or that sentence. Tip number seven. Normally, don't delay the main verb or main independent clause. I mean, you want your main, you know, the, the independent clause, the main verb, main subject and verb, um, are the main action in the sentence. And you, you generally don't want to delay your, your, main, uh, your main independent clause. Now, this happens in several ways, can happen in several ways. Subject appears early, but the verb doesn't appear until later. Big gap between the subject and the verb. You can have a kind of a top-heavy sentence with a long or dense uh, compound uh, subject. And you can, you shouldn't, but you can, and you'll see it often in legal writing, pile up conditions before you get to the main verb. Put this main subject and verb. Put this first and let the conditions follow. So you've got a so-called right branching sentence. That is a sentence where the where the main subject and the verb appear early in the sentence. So here are a couple of examples. Uh, subject. And then look, verb shows up way down here. That's this. That's this form of delaying the main 
uh, the main verb. Uh, and the fix is easy. Uh, may be used by an adverse party. And it's easy enough to just convert passive voice into active voice. And an adverse party may use for any purpose. And then you put in all that information here, which was originally between the subject and the verb. This is an example of piling up conditions before the main subject and verb, which appears down here. The judge may make orders or may order. And look at all this repetition. If a party or a party's attorney, on behalf of a party, if a party or party's attorney, if a party or party's attorney, you can pull all of that into the lead in to the list. So not only does it sort out all of all of these items in a convenient way for the reader, but it avoids all kinds of all kinds of unnecessary repetition because you can pull that into the lead in. And here is the main subject and verb, not at the very beginning, but but toward the beginning. In the vertical list. Tip number eight, break up long sentences. And you're getting a bonus tip uh, in this because there's an A, a number eight, eight, one and eight, two. So one way, and there's, there's lots of different techniques for this, but one way is it to do this is to pull an exception into a new sentence, typically beginning with but. Now let's stop just for a second and explode a couple of what I think are myths. Well, what I, I know the first one is a myth, and that is that you shouldn't start sentences with and, but, or so. There's never been any such rule, you know, and it's, and it's, it's, a, it's actually a hindrance to writers because but is the way to make the turn. So, uh, and the other myth is that an exception has to appear, for my money, uh, that an exception has to appear in the same sentence as the main rule. I don't know why. I mean, you, I think you can trust readers to read two consecutive sentences together and see that the second one creates an exception to the first. So here, accept that. I mean, you don't even have to read, you don't even have to read it just to see here that, well, why not just start with what the following defenses may but and, and look, you know, may at the option of the pleader, but a party may assert active voice would get rid of this stating the obvious because that's what may means. But anyway, my main point is that easy enough to just start the new sentence, uh, stop here, pull the new, uh, pull the exception into a new sentence starting with but. Another way to break up long sentences. Oh, yeah, this is, an, this, this, this is, this might, this example might be a, a little bit controversial, uh, but it, it, it's in the, it's in the federal rules of civil procedure now. A party may obtain discovery. You, 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 if you're trying to sort out the structure and the logic of this, a party may obtain discovery only upon showing, okay, so you generally can't obtain these materials, but you can if. So, so ordinarily, now there's a word you don't see very often in legal drafting, ordinarily, but it, it's, 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 it's now in some of the, uh, some of the federal court rules. Ordinarily, you can't get these materials, you can't discover these materials, but see, that's the same technique. You're pulling the exception into a new sentence beginning with, but those materials may be discovered and here you go with your vertical list. I generally like to avoid Romanets uh, if I can, the little I, the little one, the little two. Uh, but sometimes the material is so dense that you just, it, 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 it's hard to avoid. And this was one of those instances. So I just want you to see the pattern here, except that if. 
and this is a long, this is what you call a long or a longish at least sentence, right? But, period, but. And uh, I just, we just don't have time to do every one. This is the second way for breaking up long sentences. Second technique, as I say, there's more than two, but I'm here are two good ones. Stop and repeat a keyword at or near the beginning of a new sentence. Okay. An application of the court for an order shall be made, must be made by motion. Which, unless made during a hearing, shall state, see? Okay, so the motion, you have to uh, have to make it by motion, and here's what the motion has to state. So stop. A request for a court order must be made by motion. Okay. Stop the motion. Just repeat motion and start and, 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 and start a new sentence by repeating a keyword, or sometimes it's an idea at the beginning of the new sentence. And these requirements for a motion will fit nicely into a vertical list. Tell you what I'll do on this one. Um, in the interest of time, you, you can, may, if you wish, take a screenshot of this and revise it. And send me your revision into the and for the first two A revisions, grade A revisions that I get, I'll send you a book. Whoop de doo. But you, you're on your honor. You can't do this until after two. If you're interested in doing it at all. Give you a little hint. Let's file a list. Mm, here's what the list should show. Let's file a list. Here's what the list should show. Can you break that into two? Can you break that into two sentences? Ditch provisos. This is pretty standard advice for legal drafting. Because <clears throat> it, it's again, it's just another way of dragging out the sentence. Provided that if. Sounds like this is going to be an exception. So once again, period. But if. And there's lots of other things we could illustrate here with this example, lots of plain language techniques. Practice as herein prescribed probably is stating the obvious. Governs in actions involving watch, the exercise of, the power of, eminent domain under the law of a state. Now, again, I'm not making these examples up. Watch. These rules govern an action for eminent domain. Law of a state. Turn it into an adjective. Under state law. Provided that if state law makes provision for, you'll all recognize this as a zombie noun or an abstract noun. Isn't there a buried verb there? Provides for, liquidate zombie nouns. There's a lot, a lot that we could squeeze out of that. But the main point is the proviso, just don't use them at all in legal drafting. Start a new sentence. Finally, <clears throat> Tip number 10, as I grow older and marginally wiser, I realize more and more the importance of structure, design, organization, and headings, informative headings and subheadings are such crucial navigational aids to the reader. And not, not only for the reader's benefit, but for the writer's benefit. If, you, if you've got dense material over here and, it, and you can't break it out fairly easily into headings and subheadings, maybe there's something wrong with the organization. Maybe there's something in here that doesn't belong. Uh, if you can't come up with some good headings and uh, subheadings. But just look at the reader 
old readers, former readers of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 8B. There, that's all you had is that it for a heading. Now look. Same thing with old 16B, headings, subheadings, sub subheadings. They, and the, the parallel, parallel, parallel structure for the headings and subheadings is such a joy, you know. Contents required, permitted. Even a short provision, even a short provision, which this isn't terribly long, can benefit from headings and subheadings. General right to amend. Okay, by a debtor, by a party of interest, a party in interest. Nicely, nicely parallel. Reader can see immediately which one applies to him or her because of the uh, because of the subheadings. Critical navigational tools for the reader and organizational checks for the writer. So those are my 10 tips. Here is some further reading. This one, good little pamphlet, is available online. You can find it online. Brian and I, as a matter of fact, are now revising this and expanding it. Uh, but it's currently available online. All you have to do is Google the title. And here are a couple of, I think, Pretty good books on uh, legal writing. Many of the examples, by the way, many of the examples that I've just showed you come from this uh, second one, Seeing Through Legalese. And I hope I'm within my time. Uh, and those are my 10 tips. Thanks for listening. Hope I didn't go through them too fast. And if there's time for questions, I can, I'm happy to take questions. There's one question, um, Professor Kimball. Um, Jeffrey Osmond asked, I'm elated to learn that shale is finally being replaced by, with must in federal legal writing documents. How long before all lawyers are converted in habit and law schools make the shift to? Well, that's 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 a very good question. And, I, and I'm just gonna be honest about this. This is a controversial subject, even among legal writing experts. So there are some legal writing experts that still recommend keeping shale, uh, but I, we've, we've, we've shown, I hope, to the federal rules of civil, uh, uh, well, all the federal rules. We redrafted four sets now of federal court rules. Um, and we're work as a matter of fact, we're working on the fifth. Uh, uh, Brian and I Brian and I are involved in uh, redrafting the federal rules now of bankruptcy. Been working on that for a couple of years. So we've shown that it'll work in uh, at least in uh, in federal rules. I think it will work in regulations, whether it works in contracts or not is as I say, it's a, a, a controversial issue, even among the experts. He further it's asked if there's... It's, it, you know what, it, 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 to be honest, it's probably not gonna <laughs> disappear. Shell's probably not gonna disappear anytime soon. He further asked if there's a directive um, to federal employees. Um, not that I know of. That he can cite to. Not that I know of. So, I'm supposed to have 10 tips, everybody. Um, I really have one tip. My one tip is we've, we've always got to think about the reader. We have to serve the reader. When we serve the reader, we serve our clients. We serve ourselves. Uh, so, that's my message. It's one message. Um, but. They told me to embellish and elaborate a little bit, you know, to fill my half hour. So, so here we go, ladies and gentlemen, 10 tips, uh, really for, for most any type of legal writing. Um, but you'll see some of them may relate more to, um, to court briefs. Um, and here we go. 1st tip. Use words in your sentences. Just drink it in people. That is the type of insight and innovation that I am famous for. We should use words in our sentences. Why don't you give that a read?
And that's what I mean by saying we should use words in our sentences. Lawyers love to litter their sentences with raw citations and extra stuff that doesn't help. Uh, so we can see everything highlighted here in blue is not words in the sentence. There's got to be some other strategy here. Uh, and now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mark does a lot of presentations on plain language and and all that. And you know, you know, he probably found this five years ago, and it's his favorite example. And so he uses it over and over again uh, in all of his presentations. And people, uh, I got to tell you, I pulled this up earlier in the week because I had to get going on this. It took me seven minutes, seven minutes to find this. I just did a random Westlaw search. And I just started pulling up. I just probably was the first case I pulled up, and uh, and it took me seven minutes to find this example, and, and that that speaks to how how common this is. So there's our our sentence is hiding there. We have a compound subject here. We've got our uh, let's see the definition, the commentators, and the cases. And lo and behold, we finally find our verb suggest down at the very bottom. Uh, so. What do we do instead? Well, we could cite afterwards. And you know, I'm, I'm not a big string citation fan, but I'd rather see a string citation after the sentence than all that citation stuff muddling up the actual sentence itself. So we can simply cite after the sentence you could drop footnotes and put the sites in the footnotes. That would make Brian Garner happy. He's he's Mr. Citational Footnotes. Or you know what? Maybe maybe that idea in that original sentence could become a topic sentence. And if we've got something valuable to say, we could follow with the sentences and cite after the sentences. So Use words in the sentence, cite after the sentences. And that's a spe again, especially true with these raw um, statute citations. So that was tip number one to use words in our sentences. Tip number two, use words in your sentences. It's not a repeat. I don't know what it is. I, I I think that legal writers almost feel like they're supposed to create acronyms and initialisms for everything possible, whether it's statutes or parties. And uh, it's it, what happens is is we introduce them as we go, uh, and then they start to accumulate. And as you get farther and farther into the document or here into the federal court's opinion. They just start to accumulate. It's like it's like we're throwing pieces of wood into a stream and somewhere downstream it just clogs the flow completely. So in, in their book, Making Your Case, Justice Scalia and Brian Gardner talked about uh, avoiding this alphabet soup approach to writing. And I just love that line, alphabet soup. That's exactly what it is. Here's another example. And, and this is another example. You notice. That's the first one. It again it takes no time to find these examples, especially if you look in environmental law cases. So here we see all of those acronyms and initialisms cluttering the prose here. That does not help with flow. And it becomes kind of like it's the insider jargon, but a judge and the court staff are not insiders. The reader is not an insider. We we need to speak to our reader. We need to. I I have the unmitigated gall to think that legal writing is a form of communication. So we need to communicate clearly. So let's avoid the alphabet soup. No alphabet soup. Use words. And this is how this is a possible revision. You guys might have other revisions uh, that could be better. Uh, but you notice, you know, 
maybe maybe you just reserve the acronym for the obvious or the initialism for the obvious one, the EPA. Okay, but then maybe we can call the department the department. And if there's only one kind of permit in dispute, maybe we can just refer to permits without the adjective. And and maybe we can refer to CAFOs, CAFOs as feeding operations. Okay. Our reader doesn't necessarily specialize in what we specialize in. And maybe we can, if there's only one statute involved, we can use the capital A act create that shorthand proper noun. This is a technique that uh, U.S. Court of Appeals Seventh Circuit Judge Easterbrook said that he likes in his interview with the Scribes Journal uh, a few volumes ago. So use words in your sentences. Words in your sentences. Tip three, start new paragraphs. I know I, you guys are calling me Captain Obvious here again. Use words and sentences and start new paragraphs, but Apparently, it's not as obvious as we think it is. Because you will see a lot of this. Are you looking forward to reading this page? How about that one? It's the solid wall of unbroken text, the wall of text. And, and it's intimidating. It's intimidating. And we don't want our reader to be intimidated. We want to invite, we want to design a document, write a document that invites the reader in, makes the reader feel like, hey, this is something that I'm, I'm uh, perhaps, you know, maybe not looking forward to if it's, it's uh, something terribly complicated, but, but at least inviting and, and uh, approachable, approachable. Look for places to start new paragraphs and, and now I was actually looking for for positive examples. Uh, I don't mean to um, to disparage uh, Justice Breyer here, but I was kind of surprised here in this example. It's again just kind of solid, unbroken text, and there's got to be a few places here. If if, if this is a, a logical transition point, learning about the majority's approach after we've learned about the minority's approach, um, or or the dissent's approach, depending on what the context is. How about starting a new paragraph there, or Maybe, maybe down here, we're, we're talking about different or certain jurisdictions. Let's start a new paragraph there. There's got to be, there's got to be a place where we can indent and give the reader's eye and brain just a momentary breath, just a pause, just a pause. So start new paragraphs. Tip four, tip four, avoid block quotations if you can, use them sparingly. Hey, we all use block quotations occasionally, but, but there are ways we can avoid them. Uh, if you break it down and just make it part of your text, you, you can act kind of like an IV unit. You can kind of regulate how much information and what information the reader's getting, and, and, you, and you have an opportunity to create cohesion and break it up a bit uh, instead of doing this. And this is just a classic punt. Hey, reader, you know, I'm busy. Uh, here, you read this. I got things to do. You, go, you, you do the reading. You do the work here, reader. Well, we, as the writer, we, we have the obligation to do the work. We need to do the work. And here's another example again. And you can see these, these lead-ins here are following the typical provides in relevant part or in pertinent part as follows colon with no hint at what information is about to arrive. And th boy, this one's a beast. Look at this one. And I guess it gets really, really important down here because I'm seeing italics and and bold. That must be really, really important information that that the reader is going to skip. Same thing here. These these are Pieces of briefs, court briefs that I pulled. And this is just not friendly to our reader. Not friendly to our reader. Now, I suggested that people just skip or skim these long block quotations. I, I was kind of going out on a limb there. Don't you think I should have some authority for that? Well, first, 
these two examples were from the same brief. And here's what the Illinois appellate court thought about it, kind of complained about the use of lengthy block quotes with little to no discussion or analysis of those authorities. That's what, whenever you talk to a judge about the quality of the writing they receive, you almost invariably hear them say, block quotes and string citations are not legal analysis. And, and it's a lament and it's a heartfelt one. You can tell. Um, here's what Justice Scalia and Brian Garner think. Many block quotes have probably never been read by anyone. And uh, Judge Mark Painter, retired Ohio Court of Appeals judge, is even more upfront. No one reads long block quotes. People skip them. We're all the same, everybody. We all skim or skip long block quotations, which is kind of, which is kind of ironic because the reason we tend to use block quotations sometimes people do it perhaps just because they they want the reader to do more of the work. Um, but uh, but often we we use a block quotation because we think we found some magically wonderful language that we we don't we don't dare tamper with it. We just want to present this this glorious block of language to the reader. It's so so good. Um, and then people skip them or skim them. Uh, so what to do, what to do when you actually really do feel like you need to, to use a block quotation. At least we can lead in strong. We can lead in strong. In other words, there is no law that requires you to say the court provided as follows, colon or the statute provides in pertinent part as follows, colon. Use an affirmative, informative sentence to lead into your block quotation, preview, capture quickly the main point that you want your reader to get from the block quotation, and, and then you know that the reader's gonna get that point even if they do skip it. But a funny thing happens, a funny thing happens here, usually with a good, strong lead-in, it kind of, it piques your reader's curiosity and they actually read the block quotation more carefully, which is presumably what you want. So here's a lovely example. Uh, and this is from a, uh, I, I believe this is from a US Supreme Court brief from 2017. Recognizing that removal of a resident alien can be as severe a punishment as criminal banishment. James Madison argued in opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts, Sedition Acts, colon, boom, block quote. I'll tell you what, after that lead in, I'm pretty interested in reading that block quotation. And I, and I already know what the block quotation says from that strong lead in. So when you do need to use or want to use a block quotation, lead in strong, pique your reader's curiosity, be informative. Tip five, get confident with short sentences. And here we see Justice Kagan. Ford is a global auto company, period. It is incorporated in Delaware and headquartered in Michigan, period. But its business is everywhere, period. Now, I'm, I'm not doing justice to that because I'm reading it and emphasizing it. You can actually see that her, her sequence of information is wonderful, and it's actually, it flows very nicely and cohesively. Ford is a global company. It's incorporated in Delaware and headquartered in the great state of Michigan, but its business is everywhere. Ford markets, sells. So you, if you want to see somebody writing with confidence and adopting the techniques that you see from professional writers outside the legal field, I mean, real writers, um, check out Justice Kagan. You can pull up, this happens to be her most recent opinion. Again, I did not search high and low for this stuff, people. I just went to the US Supreme Court's website and I went to the opinions page and I just clicked on the first opinions that came up and you can find, you can find all these great examples. Justice Kagan is wonderfully confident with short sentences, of course. Variety, sentence length variety, of course, yes. But we really want to be confident here. In that passage I just showed you, we have sentences of six words, nine words, five words, nine words. 
the average there was about 11 words a sentence, but there's a 22 sentence word there, of course, and some longer ones. So, so that's something that we can all integrate into our writing and practice it. And it really makes our writing feel more polished and, and, and it gives you more of an impact, it gives you more of an impact. Here is a, uh, I mean, I could, I could share a gazillion uh, samples uh, from and examples from, from again, quote unquote, real writers. This is David Foster Wallace. Um, and again, just look at the confidence here and look at the impact. Her real laugh was different. He pretended it had no name. He hated himself for sitting so frozen. We're talking about sentences here that are less than 10 words sprinkled in with longer, more complex sentences. You, you will notice this when you pay attention uh, once in a while when you're reading some great writing, stop thinking about the substance and just take a look at some of the techniques. Notice things like sentence sentence length and uh, and other techniques, other techniques. Tip six, and you know, I'm glad that Patrick was dropping the S bomb earlier because now I feel a little bit better about this. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I some of you may have children present, so I won't say this out loud. Um, but what do I mean by this? Well, this is what I mean. Many judges and lawyers they seem to have this aver aversion to say, saying sued or using the word sued or sue. I don't know why I think maybe they maybe we adopt this as as new new lawyers because we feel like well anyone can say sued my gosh even the journalists know how to say that lay people can say sued we better say something fancy something lawyerly like brought causes of action against commenced a legal proceeding against oh oh I'm a lawyer instituted a legal action against sued the defendant in the present case merely threatened to sue the plaintiff. Plaintiff has sued Napili Ridge for the negligent employment and supervision. Usually the act of suing isn't the big point to be made in the sentence. And hey, if if it's not, if it's if somebody has started an ar or raised an arbit arbitration claim and started an arbitration proceeding, and so the word sued is inaccurate, then don't use the word sued. Accuracy always wins. But when it's just a run of the mill civil suit, right? Like a US Supreme Court justice, the Chief Justice of the United States sued. Justice Thomas sued. Sued. Kagan has all kinds of wonderful ex writing examples. She's so good. Justice Gorsuch, Mr. Torres sued the officers. Sue, sue. Hey, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you, right? Et cetera, because I would have found it with all of the justices, but time won't permit. Don't be afraid of the word sued. Tip seven, learn the automatics. What the heck does that mean? What are the automatics? There are edits. You know, it's funny, people think that editing is, is just a function of time that if we that if we gave everybody the same document and gave everybody the same amount of time to edit that document that everybody would naturally find the same exact edits but that's not true as you could see from our previous presentations you know there are edits to be learned like question every of it's a wonderful edit that, that can improve every aspect uh, or every type of writing uh, so, so we learn edits <clears throat> and, and editors are on the lookout for these things. So I want you to be on the lookout for some of these. I call them automatics every time. If they're in your draft, you notice it, make the change when you're doing your polishing. So one is subsequent to. Subsequent to it's after say what you mean. Like chief justice Roberts say what you mean after. And frankly, even the word subsequent. I, you know, in the court's subsequent opinions, how about later in the court's later opinions? Oh, pursuant to this one. Now, I don't know if you people can notice, but that's kind of a puke green font I used here. 
which is a perfect font for pursuant to um, <clears throat> under 97 times out of 100 under works instead of pursuant to oh you see pursuant to everywhere students are students are buried in pursuant to when they're reading their cases for homework and lawyers are buried in pursuant to when they're reading court opinions thank goodness now uh, the courts are really really starting to shift away and i could give you examples of under from every single us supreme court justice i just choose i'm just choosing two here under the word under is invisible in a beautiful way we love those invisible words words that your, your eye just goes right through them gets the message but it doesn't bog your prose down it doesn't bog our writing down if you spot due to the fact that for the reason that well that's an automatic because like justice sotomayor because is a great great word legal readers love to see the word because because it means that you're giving a reason and a lot of legal readers complain that they're not seeing reasons for <clears throat> for every assertion because great word automatic edit in the event that in the event that it rains we won't go to the picnic no if it rains we won't go to the picnic if if is such a powerful word i think joe showed you that in some of his his redrafts from the from the first part of the program if it immediately signals to the reader's brain that a condition would have to be satisfied Oh, the power of that little bitty word, if. Great word. <clears throat> Tip eight, transition with care and variety. Transition with care and variety. Uh, we, need our, we need to transition carefully to, to help our reader with comprehension, to establish cohesion, to signal contrasts or, or new and consistent statements so let's see how some of the pros do it transition with care and variety so here's our chief justice with so but and then you know some variety here however notice this nice use of surrounding however in commas here in midstream and uh now i know that you all know that it's acceptable to begin sentences with these conjunctions like but and yet and so um and you're seeing the u.s supreme court justices using them with care to us again to establish clarity and cohesion and they're doing what the pros do they're doing what the pros do like tony morrison you've got to you've got to check out tony morrison's essays if you've just read her novels you've got to check out her essays they are they are breathtaking in their insight uh and here you see her doing what all pro writers do which is using these conjunction words but signals unmistakably to the brain that we have a new and contrasting idea but it keeps the flow going use however when you want to you want to kind of halt the reader you want to kind of you want you want to disrupt the flow a little with however Although is it notice no comma after although it is not a true transition word, it sets up that dependent clause, although still a swift blah 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 comma. The comma is going to come down the line where the dependent clause meets the main clause. So no comma after although, but a great, a great technique in legal writing. And yet, of course, no no need for commas after the you will see people trying to force the pause with the comma after yet and but but you don't need them. You don't need them. It works. It works. Amy Tan here, another great writer. Transition with care. Be confident with those conjunctions. All the professional writers, every professional writer in the history of the English language, every professional writing, uh, writer uh, writing in the English language routinely uses these conjunctions to start sentences they do so with care we have to be strategic make sure it works make sure it's right uh, but 
uh, if, if we're not using these conjunctions to start sentences, then we're really, we're not living up to our potential as a writer. All, all the professionals do this. Okay, tip nine, get to the point. And what do I mean? Now I'm really talking about court documents like motions, and especially the motions that come with a supporting brief where lawyers really just get into all kinds of lawyer stuff. And that's not a compliment, by the way. We've got the all cap heading style. We've got, we've got, here come the initialisms and acronyms. Here come the parentheticals, alphabet soup, and just getting into excruciating detail on the, look at all these dates. I wonder if it's really a time sensitive legal issue. Do we need all those dates, all that procedural history? I've seen way, you, you, we've all seen way worse than this, by the way. But when I look at that, I just wanna start to hack it to bits. Just want to hack that to bits and and if you do and i tell you i i read this i read it again i read it again and what you end up with really is this public service company in new hampshire moves under these rules for an order affirming because the appellant lacks standing and this i left the substance the way they had it the substantive ideas rests on hypothetical scenarios and does not raise a substantial issue. And the commission's decision was not unreasonable and unjust because they were careful. And then drop the pen right there. That's all you need. Look at your court rules on motions. All you need to do is state what relief you seek and the basis for it. And, and remember, there's a supporting brief that's going to come after this. In many jurisdictions, it's a separate document. So, so for me, I, I'm not a fan of this. And I will tell you, I did it this way in practice, and I had cases in over 20 counties in the state of Michigan and never got into trouble for not having all this junk in my motions. In fact, frankly, people, when I was out litigating, I loved it. I loved it when my opponent wrote like this. Oh, my goodness. I was a happy camper. Oh, I love it. I love it because I because I'm looking at this and I know that my opponent is not connecting with the reader. I know, I know that my opponent is not connecting with that reader, with the judge or the judge's clerk. So, hey, writing is hard. This is all challenging. But if we're always thinking about trying to make it easier for the reader, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, but we can think of ways to make it easier. And here's Justice Kagan once again. I think you've, you've uh, figured out that she's a favorite of mine. Showing you that we can communicate without all the junk. In fact, and I'm going to give a hat tip to Ross Guberman, uh, my fellow board member for Scribes, and uh, he's got some great books. Notice, notice that she just says Ford Motor Company, et cetera, et cetera, and Ford did substantial business in the state. And you know what? We all know who she's referring to with Ford. We did not need a parenthetical saying here and after Ford. Because she knows that we're intelligent readers and she respects our intelligence. We need to respect our readers intelligence. Keep it clean. We need to quiet our writing down. We need to quiet our writing down. Get rid of all the junk. Quiet it down. And my last tip, ladies and gentlemen, I actually think that guy's kind of cute. Looks matter. Now we could put on a whole presentation on just typography and document design, and I can't do that. In fact, I'm worried that I may be going over time here, so I better get to it. But when you are, when you are, whatever document it is, whether it's an email, a memo to the boss, a letter to the client, a brief to the United States Supreme Court, or or a, a release document or a, a lease. Think about document design. Think about document design. Some of the big ticket items. I hope you all have dispensed with this 
traditional all caps style. And I hope that you've also dispensed with it in the bold way. You know, students uh, always kind of recoil in horror when I put this up on the screen. And, and they say, why are you yelling at me? And my message to students, if there are any students in the crowd, your generation always says, why are you yelling at me? And my generation always says, well, this is the way we've always done it. Your generation is right, students. You're right. My generation is wrong. Stick to your guns, students. You are absolutely right in not liking this. You are right. Your future bosses are wrong. Now, I've got authority from Twitter. You know, that's where I do all my legal research. And this was an attorney's tweet. Only crazy people use all caps, and it's unnecessarily difficult to read. And then the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court replied, preach. And I consider this binding precedent. Amen. Chief Justice, amen. And I think it would be easier to read if we just used lowercase. And, and the bold can help to help the reader easily distinguish it from the regular text. But, um, but I think we can do a little better. One of the reasons is what happens with the all cap style is we lose our ascenders and descenders. It's all blocked the same way. So you notice, when we write, we've got words that have ascenders like the D here, okay, the B here, okay, and some descenders like the G goes below the line here a little bit. Those help our brain process what we're reading. We have a little descender here with the Y. Those little things help our brain to work. And when we block, we, we take that tool away from our brains. So anyway, always think about the reader. Think about your document design. I am done, people. Thank you so much for coming. I will get out of this and stop sharing. But wonderful to have you here, and thank you so much. I would like to just, well, first up, can you hear me okay? My aunt, okay. First of all, I want to thank my co-presenters so much for uh, doing this. The pay uh, for this, uh, doing this, is, as you can imagine, is quite meager uh, for the, <laughs> to, the, to the vanishing point. So I thank them for their efforts. I thank all of you for, uh, for, for attending. Uh, I hope you found this useful. This won't be the last seminar that we do. We're going to try to do roughly one a year. Uh, I do want to mention, because Patrick had uh, put up some good resources, uh, I do want to mention two other free resources, really uh, invaluable resources. One is, if I may say so, the plain language column in the Michigan Bar Journal uh, actually goes back to 1984, and we have every single column since 1984 uh, available for free on uh, online. And you can find it easily by Googling and you might want to write this down. It's a noun string. I apologize for this, but plain language column index. So it's basically plain language column plus index. And you will find every column going back to 1984. And it's been described as a gold mine of uh, uh, information about the, the theory and practice of plain language. And a second excellent resource is the Scribes Journal of Legal Writing. Again, if Mark and I both do say so, uh, Mark is the executive editor. I am the, uh, there you go. I am the senior editor. And uh, most of the issues going back to, I think there have been 19 issues so far. Uh, and, 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 uh, oh, and uh, by, oh, by the way, Patrick is, a, a, well, uh, yeah, going back to 19, uh, uh, going back 20, 20 volumes are available online. Some of the very most recent ones, right? I, th I think Mark or not, but you'll find the, uh, all of them online. All of the leading legal writers have written for the scribe, Maybe not all, but many of the uh, leading legal writers have written for the scribes journal. And again, you can find that by just going to scribes.org. Uh, 
org. Uh, and going back to the plain language column, Mark has contributed many columns over the years. Uh, Patrick has been a, uh, uh, a more recent contributor, but a very uh, a frequent contributor to the, uh, uh, with some wonderful stuff on persuasive writing and rhetoric. And uh, so I think you'll find both of those sources to be, yeah, invaluable. So I don't know if, if there aren't any more questions. Uh, I guess we actually wound up ending a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit earlier here, a little bit early. We went, we can wait to see if there's just a couple more questions. But Audrey, do you see anything more in the in the questions? Well, it was great to have people spend some of the day with us and we Thank again we appreciate much. it i know this this is a long this is a long lunch hour for people so uh thank you so much i just want to say it's so much fun to present with joe as always but also i was i've been really looking forward to meeting to properly meeting patrick and i've been enjoying working with him he's authored a number of pieces for the scribes journal as, as joe said and he's been wonderful to work with and i've really enjoyed um uh, presenting with him and, and reading his work. So um, read what Patrick and Joe have written. That would be a great way to improve as a writer is to read Joe Kimball and Patrick Barry. And you will improve, you will them. improve. <laughs> he's, he's been also, been there's a couple of questions that popped up. Audrey, you can answer those in the chat. And I'll say, uh, yes, read the stuff, but also note that our stuff is always edited stuff. Right, Mark edits my stuff. Joe edits my stuff. Joe edits my stuff again. Joe edits stuff my again. Uh, this <laughs> is always a big part of the process. So uh, anybody who's nervous about getting started, realize that the professionals uh, always have multiple iterations and are always progressing towards clarity and rarely achieve it on the first or even fifteenth draft. Yeah, a fresh set of eyes is a wonderful thing to have. Absolutely. Okay. Then Thanks again, attendees. With that, we'll, we'll wrap Bye -bye it up. Bye, everybody. <laughs>